they receive those connections from the rat and they can daisy chain those connections back out to the command and control center on the internet so that the internet attackers have control of the rat in the DMZ. Hello and welcome to the Industrial Security Institute. I'm Andrew Ginter with Waterfall Security Solutions, and we are working our way through the top 20 cyber attacks on industrial control systems. In this series, we are using the top 20 attacks to compare the strength of two different security postures at a hypothetical water treatment plant. One security posture is sort of vintage 2013 classic software-based security, sort of one of everything intrusion detection systems, layers of firewalls, antivirus systems, security updates, encryption. In the second security posture, we're evaluating some hardware security. We have replaced the ITOT firewall with a unidirectional security gateway as the sole interface between the IT network and the industrial control system. So let's get started. Today's attack is targeted ransomware. A ransomware team has decided to target our water treatment facility specifically. They do their homework. They find out the names of our team members on social media. They find out what projects those teams are working on. They look at press releases about what kind of software, what kind of products we're using, and they craft a very convincing fake piece of email or three targeting our people, stealing remote access credentials. They use those credentials to log into the IT network as if they were our people. They do things on the IT network. They start by planting a remote access trojan. This is you know, a so-called rat. The rat is a piece of software that connects back out through the IT firewall into the internet and connects to an internet-based command and control center. This gives our attackers, wherever they are in the world, access to the rat constantly. Now they can operate computers inside of our network without logging in with these passwords again. If these remote access passwords are changed because someone gets suspicious, the rat is still there. The rat still provides these attackers with access to our systems. The rat is a powerful tool. It generally has capabilities or modules that can be downloaded. Modules or functions that will let the rat harvest credentials, harvest hashes, pass the hash, move around to other machines. A lot of these rats have features that look a lot like remote desktop. They let remote attackers see what's happening on the screen. They let the, the attackers move the mouse remotely. They give the attackers control of our compromised equipment. The rat is used to spread the influence of the attackers to other machines, to plant the rat in other places on the IT network to learn about the IT network and to do so generally very cautiously, very slowly, very quietly, so that the attackers are not triggering intrusion detection alarms. Eventually, these attackers find their way into the industrial network. They might do it by creating uh, a new account for themselves and logging into the jump host. They might do it by disabling the two-factor authentication on the jump host so that they can just log into the industrial network. They might do it by reaching through intermediate systems. For example, they might have stolen the password for the historian administrator, and they would log into the historian in the plant DMZ using those credentials. They can then upload software because historian administrators can do this. They upload software to run analysis tools, to run optimization tools on the, on the historian. They upload the software, they run it. Well, it's not an optimization tool, it's another copy of the rat. They have extended their influence into the DMZ. The rat in the DMZ is not able to connect to the internet. If we remember from scenario number one, that DMZ is not able to connect to arbitrary IP addresses out on the internet, but the DMZ generally is allowed to connect to arbitrary or sometimes specific IP addresses in the IT network. The attackers are in the IT network. They've taken over one of those machines. They receive those connections from the rat and they can daisy chain those connections back out to the command and control center on the internet so that 
the internet attackers have control of the rat in the DMZ. They can repeat the process into, for example, an OPC server or some other kind of server on the industrial network. You work your way through one layer of firewalls at a time, daisy chaining communications back out to the internet. In this way, they get control of equipment in the industrial network. Once they have a foothold on even one industrial machine with their rat, they can generally spread out very easily. In most industrial networks, in our hypothetical waterworks, you know, we're a typical industrial network. In most of these networks, most of the machines on the industrial network can use remote desktop or VNC or a tool like that to take over any other machine in the network so that no matter where our technicians are sitting, they can touch whatever they need to. So once our attackers are in to even one machine, they can just log into all of the other machines in the industrial network. What do they do? They plant, not the rat anymore, they plant ransomware on these other machines. And they trigger the ransomware on one machine. What's that ransomware do? It encrypts a handful of files to prove that it can encrypt files. And it throws up a message and says, ha ha, I've taken over your industrial network. You have 24 hours to pay me a half million dollars. Okay, not $300 like common ransomware charges for a single machine. If you want to save your network, you pay me a half million dollars or I'm going to wipe out your network. Uh, you know, look at this machine. I've, I've encrypted a bunch of files. Here's the evidence. What happens? Our incident response teams spring into action. They disconnect the ITOT firewall. They isolate the industrial network. They erase the machine that's been affected. They desperately try to find all of the other copies of the ransomware. 24 hours go by, nobody's paid the ransom. And what ransomware is still installed on these machines says, well, nobody has sent me a, a countermanding order. Time is up. And they encrypt everything they can. And this ransomware, in this scenario, doesn't just encrypt everything. Where the ransomware has permission, it erases the BIOS. This renders the machine that's been compromised permanently unbootable, even if we have backups. We just, the machine has to be replaced. We're suffering weeks of downtime at this point. This scenario is loosely modeled after the kind of targeted attacks that recently took down a Honda manufacturing facility that recently took down um, a power distribution facility in Brazil. Both of those attacks used the so-called snake malware, the snake ransomware, and were, as I said, targeted. In terms of consequences, this is a medium consequence attack. The, in, in the Honda scenario, the plant was down for a week. Um, in terms of sophistication, this is a moderately, you know, to moderately to thoroughly uh, sophisticated attack. These attack teams generally are teams with specialists. There's a specialist who will do social media research and craft phishing emails. There's another couple of specialists who will write the RAT software, who will write the ransomware software. There's a specialist for the interactive attack, operating the RAT to move around in the network and to do so slowly without triggering intrusion detection systems. There's a, a specialist, once the money has been, has been received, to launder the money, to make it disappear and make it reappear inside of some legitimate business to look like clean money that, that can safely be spent. So how do our two defensive postures hold up against this attack? Well, the classic 2013 software-based defensive posture does not reliably defeat this attack. Again, security updates don't help us because this attack exploits permissions not vulnerabilities. Antivirus is not helping us here because the rat is custom. This is not a piece of common malware, this rat, that has been detected on millions of machines and so there, of course, are, are antivirus signatures for it. This is stuff that's been cut, custom written by this team for this purpose and nobody's seen it before, so there aren't antivirus signatures for it. Intrusion detection might catch this attack it depends on how clever our attackers are and how busy our incident response teams might be with other emergencies. You know, to that end, um, these, this class of attacker is not above causing a bit of an emergency. Let's say planting some common malware demanding 300 bucks uh, a ransom 
on a couple of machines on the IT network, or maybe stealing a little information and holding it for, for ransom from the IT network to distract the incident response team and the people who are looking at security alerts, distract them to the point where they might ignore a couple of low priority alarms that are coming out of the industrial control system. So intrusion detection might have caught this attack, but does not catch it reliably. And how does the modern unidirectional security posture fare in the face of this scenario? Well, when a unidirectional gateway is installed as the only connection between the industrial and IT networks, it's not physically possible to send attack information through the, the gateway hardware into the industrial network. Not rat commands, not malware, not remote desktop, not nothing. And so the unidirectionally protected water treatment plant reliably defeats this class of attack in spite of its you know, medium grade of sophistication. So at the end of our fourth attack scenario, here is what our cyber design basis threat scorecard looks like. The unidirectionally protected architecture is pulling ahead just a little. That's what I had for you this time. Thank you for joining us at Waterfalls Industrial Security Institute. And you listened to the whole episode. Give us a like and a subscribe. Thanks.